Recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has unearthed a mysterious ancient galaxy, and it might completely change our understanding of the nature of dark matter and the process of galaxy formation. The telescope has managed to spot a stellar population bigger than our home Milky Way galaxy from 11 billion years ago, and it shouldn't actually exist. This galaxy is massive and is home to extremely old stars. They formed in the early universe. The problem is that this new observation upends our current cosmological models, since by the time of the galaxy's birth, not enough dark matter had built up to seed such a formation. Researchers have been chasing this particular galaxy for seven years. They spent endless hours observing it with the help of the two largest telescopes on our planet to figure out how old it was. Unfortunately, it was too faint and too red, so no one could measure it. Only after scientists moved their observations to space and started using the James Webb Telescope did they manage to confirm the nature of the galaxy. The thing is, unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits around Earth, James Webb moves around the sun one million miles away from Earth. That's why it made it possible to see the galaxy clearer. Previously, astronomers were sure that in early cosmic times, there were very few huge galaxies. But recent findings challenged these theoretical models. Extremely massive dormant galaxies have been discovered as early as one to two billion years after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. The scientist who led the spectral analysis of the James Webb Telescope Data said that they were doing everything possible to confirm the oldest galaxies that existed deep in the universe. When they did, it pushed the boundaries of the current understanding of how galaxies form and evolve. And now, the main question is, how they managed to form so fast in the early universe, and what enigmatic mechanisms made them stop forming stars all of a sudden while the rest of the universe was still doing so. Galaxy formation is largely dictated by the concentration of dark matter. You see, around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It supposedly affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. Finding extremely massive galaxies so early in the universe is posing serious challenges to our standard model of cosmology. All because astronomers don't think that such monstrous dark matter structures as the ones hosting those massive galaxies had enough time to form. Researchers need more time to figure out how common such ancient galaxies are and how massive they can be. But if they manage to find more of those, it will really upset our ideas of galaxy formation. But it could improve our understanding of the physics of dark matter. Bizarre ancient galaxies aren't the only thing discovered thanks to James Webb. For example, Scientists have long suspected that supermassive black holes could have existed in the early universe, and this theory has been proven only thanks to the JWST and its infrared eye. It showed that an ancient black hole within galaxy Sears 1019 was actively munching on all the matter it could lay its hands on. This hole is from the times when our universe was less than 600 million years old, and that's another mystery we're yet to crack. It's supposed to take way longer than 600 million years for a supermassive black hole to grow to its full potential. Astronomers were watching the galaxy hosting the unusually old black hole as part of the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey. They saw the galaxy as it was when our 13.8 billion year old universe was just 570 million years old. Besides the ancient black hole, scientists spotted two other ones. Those probably appeared 1 and 1.1 billion years after the Big Bang. They also discovered 11 ancient galaxies that existed between 470 and 675 million years after the beginning of cosmic history. Space is a dangerous place. It seems like wherever you go, something tries to get rid of you. So what if you wanted to go up there without a spacesuit? What's good is that your body probably wouldn't explode. Your skin is strong and stretchy enough to deal with all that pressure. You wouldn't freeze right away either. In space, the only way for your body to lose heat is through radiation, which happens very slowly for a relatively cool object like a human body. You would eventually get cold, but it would take a while, or your fluids would evaporate. Keep your eyes closed if possible. Okay, the air would be the first emergency problem here. Your brain wouldn't be able to get oxygen, so you'd pass out within 15 seconds. And within three minutes, your brain would shut down forever. If someone rescued you within the first 30 seconds, you might only have some bruises on your skin from all the pressure changes. 
Hopefully you didn't try to hold your breath before they catapulted you out there, though. In that case, the air in your lungs would cause them to rupture, which, again, wouldn't be a happy end. But here's a spot where no one would be able to save you, the center of the galaxy. Each galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, and these are even worse than you might expect. They eat up a bunch of matter and release an enormous amount of energy. The largest of these gobblers, and the hungriest among them, are something we call quasars. Well, to be precise with the relations here, quasars actually contain supermassive black holes that eat everything in their way. And these quasars are some of the most energetic space objects that we know about. When something falls into a quasar, it gets really hot and shoots outward at very high speeds because of the strong radiation force. Quasars can deceive you if you try to observe them through a telescope because you might think you're looking at stars. Astronomers also named them quasi-stellar radio sources because the signals were coming from one place similar to how it goes with a star. But quasars, of course, have a stronger light. They can shine much brighter than a galaxy with billions of stars. But this same radiation that makes them so bright is not such good news for the galaxies where they're located because these guests are not very polite, and they're slowly ripping them apart. Okay, maybe not that slowly. As a black hole eats matter, hot gases circles around it and produces very intense radiation, which then creates a quasar. Scientists use the famous Hubble Space Telescope to study 13 insanely powerful quasar outflows of radiation. This energy can travel at speeds over 40 million miles per hour, and reach temperatures of billions of degrees. One particular outflow of radiation they studied got faster and went from nearly 43 million miles per hour to about 46 million miles per hour in only three years. The energy these outflows carry is several hundreds of times stronger than all the light our entire Milky Way galaxy emits. And all this hot gas is moving so fast that it can really cause a lot of damage to the host galaxy. It rushes through the galaxy like a massive tsunami, faster than anything we've previously discovered in space. At the same time, it's pushing apart all the potential material that could get together and form new stars. In just one year, this quasar wave can push away as much matter as hundreds of suns and create spectacular fireworks. I mean, the light show would be cool, but that seems like an awful lot of wasted material. These things we're discovering can really help us answer the question that's been bothering us for such a long time. Why do big galaxies stop growing after they reach a certain mass? No wonder when the quasars don't even allow new stars to be born. How rude! I mean, a black hole itself can't destroy the whole galaxy. When a star gets too close, a black hole will tear it apart with its strong gravity. This creates a lot of energy and a bright flare too. And even though we can't really see a black hole itself, scientists can at least study these flares. They can measure their energy more accurately than ever before because they look at how the surrounding dust absorbs and re-emits the light from the flares. It's actually similar to how echoes work. Scientists have also used NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory to study more than 100 galaxies and realized these black holes are consuming thousands of stars so they could gain more weight. There are different types of black holes. We call smaller ones stellar mass black holes. They're about 5 to 30 times the mass of our sun. On the other end of the scale, there are supermassive black holes that nest in the centers of large galaxies and weigh millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. And recent research tells us there are intermediate mass black holes which lie in between the two extremes. And it seems these intermediate black holes could be small black holes that had been eating lots of stars, becoming bigger. The special buffet a black hole just can't resist is when there's a dense cluster of stars in the center of a galaxy. Yup. So yeah, black holes are mean fellas, but there's still no way they could eat a whole galaxy. A black hole's gravity is just not strong enough, unless there's a quasar around, making its force stronger. Don't worry though, quasars are usually billions of light years away from us. That means we see them as they were billions of years ago, because light takes time to travel. 
and light years represent the amount of time necessary for that. It's great that we can study quasars, not because they're pretty cool, terrifying, but still cool. But because with their help, we can learn more about how our own galaxy formed and developed. Quasars are part of a larger group of objects called active galactic nuclei. This family tree also includes safer galaxies and blazars. These are not as awesome as their cousins, but okay, we'll give them a short introduction. Seyfert galaxies may look normal in regular images, but they emit a lot of infrared radiation, radio energy, and X-rays. Basically, they're similar to quasars but release less energy, and they have supermassive black holes at their centers too. Copycat! Blazar and quasar sound pretty similar, huh? Still, they're a bit different. The story of a blazar starts in a familiar way. At the center of a galaxy, there's a giant black hole surrounded by a disk of dust, gas, and debris that spins really fast. As the material in the disk falls towards the black hole, its gravitational energy can end up being converted to light. This makes the center of these galaxies very bright, and we call them active galactic nuclei. Some of these active galactic nuclei are not fine with just shining bright, so they shoot out jets of material that nearly reach the speed of light. This is a quasar. But when a galaxy happens to turn so that the jets point towards our home planet, it's what we call a blazar. And yes, it's like Earth is staring down the barrel of a cannon. Quasars and blazars emit jets of particles pointing towards us or in our direction. Scientists believe Seyfert galaxies are different because they emit jets pointing away from us, which is why it's harder to detect them. These jets from blazars can release particles with lots of energy that we call neutrinos. A couple of years ago, scientists discovered a single neutrino that traveled from a supermassive black hole in a blazar located about 4 billion light years away. This was so exciting because we've captured neutrinos from only three cosmic sources so far. Our sun, a supernova, which was a powerful explosion that happened in a nearby galaxy in 1987, and now from the blazar. During the recent years, scientists made two breakthrough discoveries about our universe. Thanks to new technologies, we've looked into the distant past. And we've learned something that can change our understanding of the universe forever. What are these discoveries and what do they mean to us? Let's find out. Recently, we unveiled the first color image from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a mind-bending photo capturing thousands of ancient galaxies. This oldest documented light in the history of the universe dates back over 13 billion years. That's just 600 million years after the Big Bang. It's like getting a sneak peek into the universe's baby album. But that was just the beginning. Astronomers were expecting to see some tiny young galaxies. But what they found was a real surprise. Impossibly early, impossibly massive, and all that from just a tiny red dot. The lead author of the study, Ivo Lab, was working at the computer as usual, and suddenly he got two numbers. Age, 13 billion years. Weight, 100 billion stars. When he realized what that meant, he nearly spit out his coffee. But that red dot was just the beginning. The next day they found five more galaxies just like this. Turns out, these six massive galaxies are as old as the Milky Way itself. The entire research team was in disbelief. They were like, wait, what? These guys couldn't be that mature so early in time. Did we make a mistake? But nope. The James Webb Space Telescope, the new cool guy on the space block, just has some serious skills. It can see through dust clouds with its infrared vision and spot galaxies that were previously invisible. Move over Hubble. There's a new stargazer in town. But why is it shaking things up so much? Because this discovery affects our understanding of how galaxies formed. Let's try to explain. A long time ago, 13.8 billion years ago to be precise, our universe was born. It was chilling out for a while and then it started to form the first galaxies. And these galaxies were full of gas and dust. Eventually this gas started turning into stars. Some galaxies were more massive and had more stars. And some were lighter and had almost no stars at all. In any case, they all grew gradually. The stars in them were born slowly and smoothly. That's how our current models explain this. But these new observations from the James Webb Space Telescope show an unexpected surprise. Looks like 
Even in the early universe, our ancient friends had lots of stars. More than what we would ever expect. If that's the case, then these galaxies are like the overachievers of the universe. They skipped the small and gradual growth phase and went straight to being giant universe breakers. According to our current cosmological model, they shouldn't even exist. But they do, so... It looks like after the Big Bang, the stars were forming much faster than we thought. Which is pretty weird. This could mean that there's something missing in our understanding of the galaxy formation. As you can see, these universe breakers are really living up to their name, causing a potential total consensus among scientists. The universe was like, Hey, I'm about to flip cosmology models upside down. But let's not jump to conclusions. There are many theories that could explain these mind-boggling discoveries without breaking the standard model. For example, maybe the light we're seeing isn't coming from stars at all, but from the swirling disks of doom around supermassive black holes. These colossal cosmic beasts can gobble up matter and spit out a dazzling light show. And James Webb Telescope's keen eye is picking up on these enigmatic accretion disks like never before. Or maybe these galaxies could be playing hide-and-seek with us. Maybe there's more to the story that we haven't seen yet. After all, the universe is vast and mysterious, and we've only just begun to scratch the surface. And whoa, 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 we really need to slow down here. Before we even try to explain all this stuff, we need to confirm whether these ancient galaxies really are that old. Although even if they're actually just supermassive black holes, it still shows an astounding change. We'll have to wait about a year to find out. One thing's for sure, the James Webb Space Telescope has definitely taught us a valuable lesson. Expect the unexpected. And this is just the beginning of unexpected. Evo Laba's team wasn't the only one who made such a huge breakthrough. There's also a team that claims that they've unlocked the secrets of the universe's past, and that's worth two Nobel Prizes. Move over, James Webb Space Telescope, because this discovery came from an antenna that's smaller than a fridge and costs less than $5 million. Talk about space bargain hunting! The astronomers caught this signal that showed some surprises. It was coming from the earliest stars of our universe, back in the days when they were just beginning to twinkle. Say hi to our celestial ancestors again. Now, the signal was pretty weird. The temperatures were unusually low, and there was a pronounced wave that left astronomers scratching their heads. What could be causing all this? Well, there's a theory. Dark matter may have been at work, and if that's the case, then we can really be on the verge of a great discovery. Imagine you're looking at the night sky filled with stars, but there's something else there that you can't see. It's like an invisible cloak that covers the entire universe. Scientists call this mysterious stuff dark matter. Dark matter is like the ghost of our world. It doesn't emit, absorb, or reflect any light. We can't see it with telescopes or our eyes. That's why we call it dark matter. But if we can't detect it in any way, how do we know it exists? Because of its gravitational pull. One day we noticed that our understanding of how galaxies were created was incorrect. According to our calculations, they should have been some chaotic gas. But something held them together, turning them into spirals, like some kind of invisible glue. Then we thought, maybe this invisible glue really exists. If the moon was invisible, we would still suspect that it exists somewhere because its gravity affects the tides on Earth. This is also the case with dark matter. Its gravity influences the motion of galaxies and other cosmic objects. In fact, dark matter makes up a huge chunk of the universe, about 27% of it. Moreover, the normal matter we can see, like stars, planets, and galaxies, only make up about 5% of the universe. So even though we can't see dark matter, there's actually more of it in the universe than everything we can see. Scientists are still trying to figure out if dark matter exists and what it can be made of. Some theories suggest that it could be made up of exotic particles that are different from the particles that we're used to. Others think that it might be some kind of weird, undiscovered form of matter that doesn't interact with light at all. Anyway, it's an intriguing mystery. And if we ever confirm the existence of dark matter, our understanding of our world will change forever. So now you can understand why the excitement in the scientific community is palpable. If this discovery is confirmed, then we will get the first real proof of dark matter. This discovery may be even more important than the Big Bang itself because, as astronomers put it, 
We are made of star stuff, and so we are glimpsing at our origin. But of course, we still have to wait and explore all this in great detail. In science, one should never rush to conclusions. And while scientists study this stuff, we'll be here, on the edge of our seats waiting for the next space blockbuster to unfold. The universe never ceases to amaze us with its wonders. Who knew that such a small and humble antenna could unlock such cosmic secrets? It just goes to show that in the vastness of space, even the tiniest discoveries can have the biggest impact. Keep looking up, and who knows what other cosmic surprises are waiting to be uncovered. You're in your galactic space cruiser on your way to Outpost 52, delivering supplies for the small colony there. When alarms begin going off, you scan your displays, but something catches your eye before you can work out what's happening. You don't need a view screen, as the front section of your ship is transparent, like a one-way mirror. A colossal orange and purple cloud is sweeping towards you. There's no time to analyze it. You put the ship into a dive, as steep as it will go. The alarms go crazy, but you're too focused on getting out of danger. The ship rattles, and you think it will break up. But your ship is fast and powerful, and somehow you manage to get underneath it. You look up and see the gigantic plasma cloud go soaring past. Curiosity has bitten you, and you decide to follow it. You program your computer to analyze it. Soon the information is coming back, and you can't believe what it's telling you. This plasma cloud is a wrecker of galaxies. It and others like it have been ending galaxies before their time. You recall your studies back on Earth when you were just a young pilot. There have been studies as far back as the 21st century as to why galaxies were mysteriously ceasing the formation of new stars, causing them to end ultimately. Stars form from thick clouds of gas that have become extremely cold. They condense and, over time, collapse into solid compact matter. There's a famous photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Most people have seen it. It's called the Pillars of Creation. It's the Eagle Nebula, where stars are forming. They call these environments star nurseries. It's a pretty cute concept if you think about it. But there's a bad guy lurking, and you're following it. It's a vast star wrecker. The wrecker rushes in and sweeps the gas out of these star-forming galaxies at an accelerated rate, preventing stars from forming in the first place. It's like a giant broom. But rather than cleaning up, it's ceasing up bringing new galaxies to a premature end. Now that you know how dangerous it is, it's best to hang back a bit. Let's see if we can see it in action from a safe distance. It had been a long-standing mystery why some galaxies don't birth new stars. The star wrecker is smart. It hangs around large galaxy clusters. There's one in particular, the Virgo cluster. This is the one that scientists studied and came across the star wrecker. The nearby Virgo cluster is 7 million light years across and contains thousands of galaxies. When I say nearby, it's about 65 million light years from us. Not exactly a weekend space cruise away, but it's pretty close in galactic terms. The cluster hurtles through the superheated plasma at speeds of up to a million miles per hour. The cluster forms the basis for the large Virgo supercluster, of which the local group, where our Milky Way resides, is a member. Its proximity to us makes it easier for scientists to study. It's also one of the most extreme regions of the universe that we know of, currently. Who knows what else is out there? The Virgo cluster is also unusual, as it's still forming new stars. And we can observe them, such as in the famous Hubble nursery photo. A galaxy in this cluster is called the Messier 87. It was discovered way back in 1781 by a French astronomer named Charles Messier. It looked a bit fuzzy to him, so he called it a nebula, a nebula without stars. More information on what it was couldn't be ascertained until the 1920s. Messier was well respected and in his lifetime discovered 13 comets. He was born in rural France, the 10th of 12 children. When he was 14, he witnessed a tremendous six-tailed comet in 1744. It was astonishing and was visible to the naked eye for several months. Its effects were dramatic and unusual. It was so bright that it's been recorded as the sixth brightest in history. Four years later, young Charles saw a solar eclipse from his hometown on the 25th of July, 1748. He knew then that he wanted to explore the world of astronomy. 
It was meant to be. A lunar crater and an asteroid have been named after him. Nothing as mighty, however, like the Messier 87, or M87. It's a supergiant elliptical galaxy with trillions of stars. It's the second brightest galaxy within the northern Virgo cluster, making it popular amongst astronomers and amateur enthusiasts. Elliptical galaxies are older, low-mass stars with minimal star formation activity. Large numbers of globular clusters surround them. They make up roughly 10 to 15 percent of the Virgo supercluster. M87 has a supermassive black hole at its core. The black hole was photographed using data collected in 2017 by the Event Horizon Telescope, EHT. It was announced excitedly to the world in 2019. In March 2021, the EHT collaboration revealed a polarized-based image of the black hole for the first time. It was a pretty exciting event. It was the first time that a black hole had been captured. It happened all thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope, which is many radio observatories or radio telescope facilities around the world, all working together to produce a highly sensitive and high-resolution telescope. Another array of telescopes in Chile is called the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA. They captured high-resolution images of the 51 significant galaxies in the Virgo cluster. That's part of how we know what we know. M87 and other galaxies don't appear to be doing a lot to the naked eye. In fact, in a typical human lifetime, they barely move at all. Yet, they are made up of gas, dust, and other objects that move through space at high speeds. They move when affected by the gravity of other galaxies, or dark matter, a mysterious entity that is five times more common than ordinary matter. Many galaxies, including our own, are believed to have a halo of dark matter surrounding them. The dark matter can pull more significantly on the smaller galaxies outside the clusters. As the galaxy gets dragged around through space, the star wrecker may come across. Giant clouds of intergalactic plasma, a form of electric gas, can behave like an atmosphere and drain the gas inside the galaxy. It sweeps out the gas inside the galaxy, stripping it of what it needs to make stars. It's hard to grasp the scale of this sort of activity. But that's what scientists now believe has been occurring to some galaxies or the nebulae without stars, as Charles Messier saw it. Now, let's park our space cruiser here and watch this thing in action. What we've been calling star wrecking is known as gas stripping. It's one of the most spectacular and violent external events in space. A scientist from the National Research Council of Canada said that galaxies are moving so fast through hot plasma in the cluster that a vast quantity of cold molecular gas is stripped from the galaxy. It's as though the gas is being swept away by a giant cosmic industrial blower. It's not the sort of clean-out we want to happen in our galaxy. You observe it in action. You're impressed, but equally respectful of its great power. The gas stripping, also known as ram pressure stripping, travels through many galaxies and removes a star-forming gas. The process is very efficient. The gas is behaving differently from the clouds in our galaxy. They aren't forming as many stars as they are in ours. A 21st century study found that the same process happens in smaller groups of only a few galaxies, with much less dark matter. The study looked at a staggering 10,567 satellite galaxies. These are galaxies that exist beyond the enormous galaxy clusters. Most galaxies in the universe exist in between 2 and 100 galaxies. They were able to study such a large number by using stacking. It makes it possible to learn about a collection of faint objects by combining all the information from the objects and making an average characteristic. They ultimately determined that gas stripping, or star wrecking, is potentially the main way that galaxies, predominantly star formation, are shut down by their surroundings. Pretty unfortunate to have such a nasty neighbor. So, now that your curiosity has been satisfied, it's best to leave this plasma cloud and get on with your journey to Outpost 52. You're going to be late now and could be in a whole lot of trouble. While the cruiser turns around, we'll head back to Earth. And back in time, back to 1744, to that night in rural France, where a teenager stood outside, marveling at the night sky and the spectacular vista of the six-tailed comet. And from that moment, was inspired to begin a lifelong quest based on a single question. Perhaps the ultimate of all, what's out there?
In the heart of the galaxy, there lies a mysterious object, the likes of which no astronomer has ever seen. It streaks across the sky like a shooting star on caffeine. So what is this mysterious blob? And how is it related to the black hole in the center of our galaxy? Let's find out. This thing is called X7. It's the mysterious blob that's been hanging around our galaxy's supermassive black hole for decades. Some even say it's been lurking around there for, like, hundreds of years. We know a few things about X7. For example, it weighs around 50 times as much as Earth. It may sound like a lot if you're an Earthling, but in space, that's like a tiny drop in the ocean. X7 is also moving pretty fast, at speeds of up to 700 miles per second. That's faster than you trying to catch the last slice of pizza before your roommate gets to it. But what in the world is this thing? A magic star we've never seen before? An extraterrestrial spaceship? Well, there are some theories connected to the blob's future tragic fate. Unfortunately, X7's days are numbered. Right now, it's on a 170-year-long elliptical orbit around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. But it's not going to make it that far. Each year, it's spiraling closer and closer to the black hole. In just a few years, it will become spaghettified. Yes, that's a real scientific term. And finally get sucked in, never to be seen again. There are supermassive black holes in the centers of all galaxies, including our very own Milky Way. These black holes are so massive that they warp space-time, causing nearby stars to orbit around them at incredible speeds. They serve as cosmic vacuum cleaners that suck in anything and everything that comes close enough. The black hole in our galaxy is called the Sagittarius A star. Sounds like the name of a fancy Hollywood celebrity, doesn't it? But this celestial object is far more impressive than any mere mortal. It's about 4 million times more massive than our sun, which means it could probably eat our entire solar system for breakfast. But don't worry, these black holes may seem really scary, but in reality, they're too small to compete with an entire galaxy. They'll just suck in a couple of the nearest stars, and that's all. Also, Sagittarius A star doesn't seem to have a very good appetite. It's been observed to be pretty quiet lately, which is good news for us. But even if it were super greedy, it wouldn't pose any threat to us. This black hole is over 26,000 light years away. From Earth, we can see it in the Sagittarius constellation. In 2022, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration released the first ever image of Sagittarius A star. It took years of collaboration and technology to capture this stunning image. And this is our second photo of a black hole in history. The first one was released in 2019, and it showed the supermassive black hole called M87 star. Yes, they both have star in their names. Don't try to make it make sense. Anyway, you may remember this photo as the first ever image of a black hole ever. It went crazy viral across the internet. And this black hole, M87 star, located in the Messier 87 galaxy, is way scarier than Sagittarius A star. You thought 4 million solar masses is impressive? Then how about 2.5 billion solar masses? M87 is a real monster. It's also known for its powerful jets of plasma, which are so energetic that they extend thousands of light years from the black hole's center. If M87 were a superhero, it would be Iron Man with his repulsor beams on full blast. Now, technically, you can't take a photo of a black hole itself since it's, well, black. No light can escape its grasp. But the glowing orange ring in this photo shows the matter surrounding Sagittarius A star. It's called the accretion disk, a swirling disk of hot gas that spirals the center, heating up to millions of degrees in the process. It's like a giant fiery vortex, but with no escape. And the shadow in the center indicates the black hole itself. 
Inside that shadow, there's an event horizon. The event horizon is the boundary around the black hole, beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape its gravitational pull. It's the point of no return, where the gravitational force is so strong that even the fastest object in the universe, light, can't escape. Once you cross the event horizon, you're doomed to fall toward the center of the black hole, where the laws of physics as we know them break down. And this is exactly the fate that awaits our unfortunate X7. Right now, the pure blob is getting stretched and yanked by powerful tidal forces. By the way, before it meets its untimely demise, X7 is expected to put on a bit of a show. Its closest approach to the black hole, called periastron, is projected to happen in 2036. And when it finally gets torn apart by the Sagittarius A star's gravitational forces, there may be some cool fireworks to see. But this is not the most important thing. The funny part is, X7's future end may help us finally understand what the heck even is this thing? A team of scientists have been studying how a strange blob orbits the black hole. And that's when they discovered that X7 has stretched to almost twice its initial length. And what does that mean? Well, it suggests that X7 is most likely made of debris ejected during a recent collision between two stars. Yep, you heard that right, a space car crash. Imagine this, two stars fall in love and start circling each other for many years. After that, they finally merge together. At this moment, they eject tons of gas and dust. And perhaps this cosmic dance created our blob baby, X7. It's basically like the crumbs left on the table after a giant space beast. Something like this is actually pretty common, especially around black holes. It's like a galactic fender bender that sends debris flying everywhere. Actually, the universe is full of mystery blobs. They're called the G objects. No, they're not the G men from Men in Black, but they're just as mysterious and elusive. These guys have been puzzling astronomers for more than 20 years. They look like gas clouds, but behave like stars. It's like they can't decide whether they want to be a cloud or a star. Come on, guys, make up your mind. G objects stretch out at the closest point to the central black hole, but emerge intact, like a rubber band that stretches but doesn't break. Scientists think that they're the stars that have merged together into one. And while doing that, they also produce a huge cloud of gas that hides the result from view. Kind of like when you're wearing a bulky sweater so that no one knows that you've put on a few extra pounds. And then a study published in 2021 found that one of these objects, G2, was actually a molecular cloud concealing three baby stars. Huh, talk about a plot twist. But X7 is the black sheep of the strange blob family. It's significantly different from the G objects, like the weird cousin you see once a year at family gatherings. Its evolution has been more dramatic. Also, it's not being held together by a mass lurking in its center. So what is it being held together by? Pixie dust? Magic? We need answers! That's why scientists believe that X7 isn't a G object itself but debris left from it. Or maybe not. We have no idea. The possibilities are endless, and that's what makes astronomy so exciting. So let's keep our eyes on the skies and see what other strange objects are out there. Who knows, maybe we'll discover another mystery blob, and this time it's going to be a spaceship. Now that would be awesome. The center of the Milky Way is a story of intense radiation, gravity, and mystery. A place where the forces of nature are pushed to their limits. But what if our own planet were to find itself in this cosmic theater? What would happen if the Earth were located there and somehow managed to survive? Let's start this journey to the heart of our galaxy and find out. Picture this. You're floating in space, surrounded by billions and billions of stars. Suddenly, you see a bright swirling mass of gas and dust in the distance. That, my friend, is the Milky Way galaxy, our home in the vast expanse of the universe. 
The Milky Way is estimated to contain over 100 billion stars and is about 100,000 light years across. In other words, if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way from one end to the other. It's a couple trillions of miles. And it isn't just a static collection of stars and gas. It's a dynamic, evolving system. In fact, the Milky Way is currently hurtling through space at a speed of about 1.3 million miles per hour. One of the most fascinating things about our galaxy is its shape. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, which means that it kind of looks like a disk with a central bulge and spiral arms. The spiral arms are the areas where new stars are born. It's where the most stars, gas, and dust are concentrated. And this is where the solar system is located. Our system is like a tiny speck in the grand cosmic tapestry of the Milky Way. It's about 26,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. A pretty long distance, isn't it? The solar system is also moving through the Milky Way as it orbits around the galactic center. It takes about 230 million years for our system to make one complete orbit around the galaxy. Just imagine that. Since the time of the dinosaurs, we've traveled just a quarter of this way. The position of the solar system in the galaxy affects our life in many ways. For example, things like the amount of radiation and cosmic rays we're exposed to, and even the likelihood of asteroid impacts, and so on. Also, thanks to our location, we can enjoy some pretty amazing views of the universe around us. From our vantage point in the Milky Way, we're able to see other galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters in breathtaking detail. We're also a part of a pretty happening neighborhood, with lots of other stars and planets nearby. So we're lucky fellas. But what would happen if we weren't so lucky? What if the Earth was located in the center of the Milky Way instead? The center of the Milky Way is home to a region of space called the Central Bulge, and it's just packed with stars. It's like a disco ball, but instead of shiny mirrors, it's covered in stars. Only this disco ball is really huge, about 10,000 light years in diameter. The center of the Milky Way is also home to some extreme environments that would make even the bravest astronauts shiver. High energy particles and intense magnetic fields can wreak havoc on electronics and spacecraft. Intense radiation fields can fry anything in their path, so it's not exactly a friendly place for life as we know it. So if the Earth were located somewhere closer to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, it would be a very different place. Let's take a look at some of the potential effects. First of all, radiation. As we mentioned earlier, the center of the Milky Way is one of the most radiation-dense regions in the galaxy. It would make life on Earth very challenging, if not impossible. Sure, we have the Earth's magnetic field, it's like a giant shield that protects us from harmful radiation from outer space. But could it protect us if we were located in the center of the Milky Way? Unfortunately, the answer is no. It's kind of like trying to use a tiny umbrella to protect yourself from a massive storm. So it would be an easy win for the galaxy. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are some brave organisms that are able to adapt to high levels of radiation. We've seen that life on Earth has evolved to survive anywhere, from the depths of the ocean to the icy poles of the planet. So, let's imagine what would happen if we somehow evolved to survive in these harsh conditions. Like, picture humans with tough, scaly skin that protects them from radiation, and plants with unique structures that allow them to thrive in this bright environment. In that case, radiation could still have some seriously spooky effects on us. For example, it could damage DNA molecules and cause mutations. Imagine a world where plants grow with five leaves instead of four. Animals have strangely colored fur. Or people have unusual eye colors or other unique features. And these are just some of the best examples. Let's not dive into the bad ones. 
Also, it could cause us to undergo some metabolic changes. Maybe our bodies could process food and other resources more quickly, which could lead to faster growth rates and larger sizes. Plants could grow tall and thick, and animals would be much larger than usual. There are also some organisms on Earth that are able to bioluminesce. Thanks to high levels of radiation, these organisms could potentially glow even brighter than usual. Imagine walking through a forest at night and seeing trees, mushrooms, and even insects glowing with an eerie blue or green light. Frightening and amazing, isn't it? But let's move on to the next big change, gravity. The gravity in the center of the Milky Way is incredibly strong, all thanks to a supermassive black hole which is about 4 million times the mass of the Sun. This black hole is called Sagittarius A. And yep, it's our neighbor now. Great! And assuming we don't get swallowed by this black hole or crushed by this incredibly strong gravity, it still could trigger lots of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. This black hole would be like the gravitational bully, pulling and tugging at everything in its path. Basically, if we survived this, we'd have an epic surfing competition every single day. Just add a bit of the thrill of risking your life, and forget about running away from the planet. No easy rocket launches anymore. And physical objects won't be the only ones affected by gravity. Time would flow very differently for us. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, time passes more slowly in areas of high gravity. In other words, Earthlings would age more slowly than someone far from the center of our galaxy. Also, the center of the Milky Way is a very busy place. Stars, planets, and other celestial objects moving around at incredibly high speeds there every day. The positions of stars and other objects would be constantly changing. In other words, say goodbye to normal navigation. The GPS system would likely be unreliable due to the strong gravitational forces and high radiation. So, if you accidentally got lost in a glow-in-the-dark forest with some creepy animals, good luck! But it's not all bad. The center is also home to molecular clouds. These are the regions of space where new stars are born. And the Milky Way in general has some pretty amazing sights to offer. For example, stunning nebulae like the Orion Nebula and the Eagle Nebula which are visible with telescopes or even just a good pair of binoculars. So, if Earth were located in the center of the Milky Way, we would have a front row seat to some of the most spectacular cosmic events. Wouldn't that be awesome? Overall, if Earth were located in the center of the Milky Way, it would be a very different place. Of course, we all understand that our planet wouldn't have survived such a change. But it's still pretty interesting to imagine how our life would flow if we were there. And judging by what we just discussed, it wouldn't be pretty. So let's treasure and appreciate our small, quiet solar system. So one day, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. So they named a telescope after him. Well, yeah, there's more to the story. Now imagine a fruitcake baking in the oven. As this cake is rising, the raisins inside are moving farther apart. Something similar happens when the universe expands. But instead of raisins, there are galaxies, which start to spread out. That's why if you randomly pick any two galaxies, the chances are they're moving away from each other. But then the question is, if galaxies are moving apart, why are there still galactic collisions? You see, even while expanding, the universe still remains a playground for galaxies to interact with one another. And they mostly do it by using gravity. All galaxies out there attract other galaxies, and their mutual pull slows down the speed of them moving apart. And naturally, the closer two galaxies are to each other, the stronger their mutual gravitational pull is. On a large scale, it doesn't seem to make any difference since every galaxy experiences a similar pull in every direction. But locally, gravity kind of overwhelms this powerful cosmic expansion and pulls together two or more galaxies which were initially moving apart. That's how galaxy collisions occur. Plus, some galaxy groups, like the Virgo Cluster, aren't expanding at the moment, 
since local gravity has stopped the expansion process in that region. Some large galaxies can attract smaller ones, and then the gravity of the larger galaxy starts pulling a smaller one toward it. Eventually, it leads to a collision. Galaxies are made up of stars, rock, dust, gas, and other materials. When two galaxies collide, their gases begin to interact. These gases usually exist in large clouds spread throughout galaxy systems. Because of their size, large clouds of gases are more likely to run into large clouds of gases. Then they start getting denser and experience more pressure. Or the combination of gases can cause waves, and the gases can collapse on themselves. Both of these processes lead to the formation of new stars. If two colliding galaxies are of the same size, many new stars are likely to form, making the galaxies shine even brighter. But if the speed of these two galaxies is too high, the newly formed stars can go right out after they appear in the sky. As two galaxies start coming closer to each other, they begin to stretch and deform, creating arms or tails. As a result, an elliptical galaxy can form. Or the collision can form a new supergalaxy. In this case, stars from each galaxy will have to find a new place within this gigantic space formation. But of course, there are tons of galaxies that have never collided with others. That's because galaxies are actually relatively small targets in our gigantic universe. They form groups of small clusters where dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of galaxies gather together. Gravity holds them tight together, just like the solar system stays together thanks to the sun's gravity. Galaxies roam within these groups and clusters in a disorganized way. Naturally, collisions are bound to occur. But since galaxies are tiny, compared to all that space they live in, massive mergers don't happen often. I'm talking about those collisions between equal size galaxies that shake things up on a grand scale. Of all the environments galaxies can live in, the most dangerous place is a group. Because solitary galaxies, living out in the field, seldom cross paths with others. As for galaxy clusters, they are indeed crowded. But galaxies in them move at such breakneck speeds that even if two of them meet, they'll simply race past each other without any dramatic consequences. But groups of galaxies are a different story. There, galaxies move comparatively unhurriedly. It makes it more likely that two galaxies in a group will not only come close to each other, but also get caught in their mutual gravitational pull for a prolonged time. And what will happen if two galaxies come close enough to collide? Well, the best way you can imagine such events is by thinking of them as merges rather than collisions. Galaxies are very spacious, and it's more likely that the stars they contain will just pass by each other. Let's talk about a galactic collision that, according to astronomers, is going to happen in several billion years or so. And our home Milky Way galaxy is going to take part in this space event. But don't worry, we still have some time to brace for the impact. Interestingly, there might be not one, but two collisions. And the first one might happen around, oh, 2 billion years from now, when the Milky Way will collide with the large Magellanic Cloud. This spiral of stars and dust is floating in space about 160,000 light years away from our galaxy. And although right now this distance is totally safe and you have nothing to worry about, in approximately 2 billion years, the two celestial bodies are likely to collide. And what a view it's going to be! Imagine the Milky Way nearing the smaller galaxy. The supermassive black hole residing in the center of our galaxy will wake up and start gobbling up the stars and gas clouds of the large Magellanic Cloud with enthusiasm. Thanks to this new food source, the hole will grow way bigger than it is now. It might even turn into a quasar, one of the brightest things you can find in the universe. Our newly awakened black hole will also be emitting long jets of superbright radiation. But people on Earth won't have anything to worry about. These jets won't reach our solar system. And even if powerful gravitational interactions triggered by the merger could probably fling us out into intergalactic space, the chances of this happening are slim. Like me winning the lottery. <laughs> Stars are located too far away from one another. 
And even such a catastrophic galactic smash-up isn't likely to jostle our solar system. Now, if our black hole does turn into a quasar, it'll be an even more breathtaking view. The thing about these celestial bodies is that their light can be up to 10,000 times brighter than the light coming from the whole Milky Way galaxy. That's why Earth's night sky might change beyond recognition. The newly born quasar will get rid of some stars and send others flying billions of miles away from their orbits. As a result, all the constellations as we know them will disappear from the sky after the familiar stars get too far away for us to see them with the unaided eye. Luckily, the chances that the Sun will get knocked out of the Milky Way are really infinitesimal. But how about the predicted collision with the Andromeda Galaxy? Will our solar system survive this catastrophe as well? Right now, the Andromeda Galaxy is nearing the Milky Way at a speed of 68 miles per second. As you may guess, it's very hard to figure out its actual speed. And until 2012, researchers weren't even sure if the collision was going to happen or not. Unfortunately, it turned out that we had to prepare for the appearance of Milkdromeda, or Milkamida, a structurally new galaxy consisting of the merged Andromeda and the Milky Way. Now, on the other hand, such collisions aren't something out of the ordinary if you consider galaxies' lifespans. Besides, even though the Milky Way is home to more than 100 billion stars, and the Andromeda galaxy contains about a trillion, the chances of several stars colliding during the galaxy's merge is really low. The reason is the same. Stars are located too far away from one another. For instance, the closest to our Sun star, Proxima Centauri, is more than 4.2 light-years away, which is about 30 million diameters of our Sun. In simpler terms, if the Sun was the size of a ping-pong ball, Proxima Centauri would be the size of a pea located 680 miles away, and the entire Milky Way would be 19 million miles wide. Wow! As for other stars, can you imagine ping-pong balls hanging in space every two miles? Great! Now you have a miniature model of our galaxy. Ooh, you're on a beautiful planet with unusual nature. Around you are ordinary people walking on this exotic planet. And now, get this, it's our new home! Humanity decided it was time to leave the Earth, and now we live very far away in another galaxy. But what happened to our home planet? Well, our solar system itself had an expiration date. It's been 7.5 billion years since 2020, and the Sun began to expand, absorbing planet after planet – Mercury, Venus, Earth. But the living conditions on Earth were unsuitable for us long before that. Let's go back there. In 4.5 billion years, our entire Milky Way galaxy will experience an incredible incident. The Andromeda galaxy will hit us at great speed. As a result of the collision, some stars will be thrown into distant space, while others will form new solar systems. But most likely, all life in the new Milkomedia or Milkdromeda galaxy will cease to exist. That's why people decided to pack up their things, get into new generation spacecrafts, and go to distant space in search of a new home. There can be an infinite number of planets in the universe on which humans can theoretically live. One of the main ingredients, the planet must orbit the star in its habitable zone. This means the temperature must allow the water to be liquid. We find similar star systems almost every year and have recently found the nearest one. It's Proxima Centauri. There are at least two planets around this red dwarf on which we can build our new home. But the problem is that this system is as far as 4.2 light years away. So we had to open our garage and choose a vehicle that could take us so far. Saturn V is a rocket that used to take humans to the moon. It could reach the speed 30 times faster than the speed of sound. Today, we have more advanced technologies, like the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. However, its speed is still about the same. It would take such a rocket about 113,000 years to overcome the distance to the closest star. So, you walk through the garage further and see the fastest human-made space object ever. The Parker Solar Probe. Its speed is a little less than half a million miles per hour, but it uses the gravity of the Sun to accelerate. 
Let's assume we can build a rocket that can reach this speed. Now we sit behind a star map, do calculations, draw diagrams, and 6,600 years. And now let's look at the photon. These are the tiniest particles that travel at the speed of light. And an obvious thought comes to your mind. How do you build a ship that can travel as fast as a photon? Well, until recently, travel at this speed was considered impossible. Fundamental laws of physics say that no object that has a mass can accelerate this much. Energy is required to accelerate mass. And to reach the speed of light, which is about 186,000 miles per second, we need an infinite amount of energy. But it's still too slow. Raise your eyes and look at the sun. It's so close to us. But the light from it reaches our planet in 8 minutes. About the time it takes to go through the drive through and get your burger. And the journey to the nearest star will take 4.2 years. You can graduate from college during such a period. But we may have found a way to cheat the laws of physics and travel faster than light. Warp drive. It's a technology that manipulates space and time to break the laws of motion. In science fiction, it's a kind of feel that envelops a spacecraft like a bubble or a shell and allows it to significantly exceed the speed of light. And we already have a similar technology, sort of. It's the Alcubierre warp drive. Since it's impossible to move at the speed of light in normal space-time, the ship must move by compressing the space in front of it and expanding it behind it. So not only the ship itself moves, but so does the space-time inside this bubble. In fact, this will allow the spacecraft to move at any speed, even 10 times faster than the speed of light. But to warp space-time, the ship must be simply humongous in size. It will need the quantity of energy comparable to the amount of mass energy of the whole planet of Jupiter. But at recent symposiums, scientists began to say that there is hope. In 2069, NASA plans to launch an interstellar mission to explore inhabitable planets outside our solar system. We do not yet know the details of this mission. It doesn't even have a name yet. But it will be dedicated to the 100th anniversary of the Apollo mission, the first man landing on the moon's surface. Here, near Pasadena, California, a small group of scientists from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab are trying their best to make it happen. And their latest calculations have made everyone shout Eureka! It turns out the ring around the ship, which should create the so-called warp field, shouldn't be perfectly round as it was thought before. It's more like donut-shaped. This will greatly simplify the design and construction. And the best part? To test this technology, a spacecraft the size of Voyager 1 probe will suffice. Researchers are now aiming to reach at least 10% of the speed of light and launch the probe to Alpha Centauri. In this case, to overcome the distance of 4.4 light years, the probe will need about 44 years. For comparison, the Voyager 1 mission was launched on September 5, 1977. In 43 years, it's traveled about 14 billion miles and is the most remote human-made object. It's also the loneliest one in the universe. It has long since left the boundaries of our solar system and is moving further into outer space. But rest assured, scientists have a couple more ideas in their secret laboratories. There are rumors now that they know how to reach the speed of light. The Space Association is considering launching small drones powered by lasers. Nuclear force, as well as collisions of matter and antimatter, can give enough energy to accelerate an object to the speed of light too. But their colleagues in a nearby laboratory are working hard to implement another technology, ion propulsion. It uses gas particles accelerated by the electric field. Simply put, your regular rocket is a daredevil on the road. He pulls the throttle to the max and burns an incredible amount of fuel to accelerate to the speed he needs. But ion propulsion is a careful old lady driving. She slowly presses the gas pedal and accelerates. On the scale of space, the old lady will have more efficiency and will be able to drive much further than the daring young man. Something we'll keep an eye on. Still, an unknown number of years will pass until there's a way to implement warp drive or ion propulsion. We want to make humankind interstellar. But first, we need to keep it alive at least. Now we're actively developing technologies to send the first manned mission to Mars. 
Colonization of Mars will be the first stage to make our species interstellar. It'll be a kind of rehearsal before colonizing distant planets. We must understand that although the conditions on the exoplanets may be close to Earthly ones, we will still have to terraform them. We must test our technology on Mars to warm it up to the normal Earth temperature. We also need to increase atmospheric pressure so that water could exist in a liquid state and create an ozone layer that will protect us from solar radiation. After that, we'll be able to breathe freely on the surface of Mars without spacesuits. We need to master all these technologies before we can create a real warp drive. Centuries ago, people sailed the oceans and perfected their ships to fully explore our planet. Now, we will be the generation to build new ships and go on long journeys outside the Earth. Warp drive will open up incredible horizons for us. Take a look at our galaxy. There are countless stars. Around each of them may be planets, and on some of them, there may be life. Warp drive will allow us to get in contact with this life and explore our galaxy much faster. And this future is already close. Soon, we'll have the chance to join the pioneers, put on beautiful suits, and travel the expanses of space in search of adventure.